Ever since I started this channel a few years ago, everyone's always been asking when are you going to get around to reviewing Banjo-Kazooie? For those who remember this game first time around, it's perhaps one of the most loved games on the console, and for many it dethroned Mario as the best platformer on the console. But with so many gamers having come to the retro scene in recent years, there will be some who may never have played this game before. So to help me spread the love of this game, I've brought along my good friend and buddy John Levitz to co-host this episode as he was a huge fan of the game too back in the day. So probably the best place to start John is to remind us all about the game's story. So what's the story? Here's the deal. Tootie, Banjo's little sister, has been kidnapped by the very ugly and evil witch Gruntilda, who has snatched Tootie because she's just too beautiful. Seems Witchy Poo's got this plan to suck the beauty out of Tootie with this super duper wart smoothing thingamajig and transfer it to herself. Yeah, right. Anyhow, Banjo and Kazooie's mission is to travel through nine mysterious worlds within Gruntilda's lair, uncover secret moves, battle evil, and collect puzzle pieces and a whole bunch of other things that will help you help them bring Tootie home. Puzzled? See, each world has 10 puzzle pieces hidden somewhere within it. These pieces fit into jigsaw puzzles hanging around Gruntilda's lair. Once you insert the pieces into a particular jigsaw, then and only then can you advance to another world. Pretty easy, huh? Don't count on it! Now if there's one thing Rare games were often known for, it was their sheer amount of objects to collect in the game. While Donkey Kong 64 took it to extremes, Banjo-Kazooie still had enough to keep gamers going back into levels to explore, to find all that it had to offer. So John, what is there to find in the game's worlds and what other characters are there to help our bird and bear duo in their quest? Our heroes can get help from a number of different characters, like Mumbo Jumbo, whose magical powers can turn Banjo and Kazooie into all kinds of creatures that help them do things and go places they couldn't before. Then there's Bottles the Mole. This bucktooth shrew is full of secrets to help you learn new moves and get out of trouble. Plus there's all kinds of collectible objects like music notes. Collect enough of these and you can move freely around Gruntilda's lair. Or Jinjos. Find five of these cute little whatevers in each world and you get a puzzle piece. And don't forget to stock up on eggs for ammunition. These will allow you to defeat and ward off enemies. Plus there are golden banjo statuettes, good for a free life. Red feathers to help you fly. Golden feathers to make you invincible. And honeycomb pieces help you store up energy. You'll need all these things and more where you're headed because Banjo and Kazooie are about to visit some very strange worlds. Check it out! But aside from the awesome and memorable characters in the game, it was the sheer size and variety of the game's worlds which blew my mind as a kid. In Banjo-Kazooie, each of the game's many areas have their own style and presentation. They are all themed and often contain hidden areas for only the most adventurous gamers to explore. So what areas can you find in the game? Well, the best way is probably to break them down, so here's John to go back over them one by one. Mumbo's Mountain is where it all begins, with beak-busting, egg-tossing mumbo-jumbo fun! you want adventure, this is the place to find it. Plus you'll learn all kinds of new moves and more. But be warned, this world is full of all sorts of monkey business, where one wrong move can mean certain doom. Forget your beach towel, because this world is no place to get a tan, as our heroes soon realize exploring Treasure Troll Cove. The tide is out, and some really crabby characters have come ashore. It's up to you to navigate through this world, where the coast isn't always clear. And although it looks inviting, a swim here could be your last! Rusty old pipes and polluted pools of water certainly won't leave you with a false sense of hope when you enter Clanker's Cavern. This vile underworld is full of some really fishy characters that would love to get their jaws on you! So don't hold your breath, because you're about to encounter plenty of underwater challenges and razor-sharp obstacles that'll suck the air right out of you and leave you gasping for more! Don't bother drying off before you enter this next world, because things begin to get a little slimy. Bubba Bloop Swamp is a dark, smelly, and dangerous place where all the piranhas, poisonous swamp frogs, and crocodiles have a bone to pick with Banjo and Kazooie. It'll take every bit of your imagination to get through this swamp, 
Because everyone here has you on the menu! Don't plan on chilling out on Freeze Easy Peak, where one wrong step will send you into a lake so cold it will take your breath away! And if that's not bad enough, try dealing with a snowman with an ice cream headache! This place is no summer camp, because the things Banjo and Kazooie encounter here will send more than shivers up your spine! Get numb just thinking about it. Well, it's out of the refrigerator and into the fire as you plunge into Gobi's Valley. This desert inferno is so hot, even Gobi himself is finding the heat too much to take. And this coming from a camel? Stay alert in this pressure cooker full of superheated sand and mummified hands, or the next mirage you see may be your last. Night has fallen permanently around the creepiest house in existence. This place will definitely bring back the nightmares. Well, actually, the dead too, as you match wits with a whole house full of ghosts, skeletons, bats, and worse. You're bound to bump into some creepy characters as Banjo and Kazooie move around this haunted house where goosebumps will be the least of your problems. Next, our heroes find themselves aboard the HMS Gruntilda, and there'll be no mistaking this ship for the love boat in Rusty Bucket Bay. Everything on board seems to have something against you, and if you're not careful, you'll definitely go down with the ship. Be on your guard as you explore this old derelict, from the funnels up on deck to the crates in the cargo hold, because you may meet a fate much worse than walking the plank. Arg! If you think it's almost over, guess again. Because even if you make it through Click Clock Wood, the most challenging world of all, you'll go on to meet the wicked warty wench of the West, and that's no bull. You'll have to use your noggin in this world, because you'll definitely meet up with some nutty characters and familiar faces as you prepare for your final confrontation with Gruntilda. So as John's just shown you, graphically the game is gorgeous. Sure Mario 64 came out way before this, but there was a certain magic at Rare that they seemed to be able to pull off visuals on the console that not even Nintendo themselves were able to do at the time. The textures are so well done that no matter where you look at the game, you'll see nothing but smooth edges and clipping is non-existent. Add into this a frame rate which rarely dips and you have a game that's as great to play as it is to watch someone else play. To do this, Rare utilised a very special draw feature for the time. Small objects fade in and out slowly the closer or further away you get from them. That allows the console to focus its brunt on the environment and then using a small amount of power available to work on the objects in the game. One complaint of the N64 was constantly about the amount of fogging games which were on the system, with bigger environments especially more noticeable. The method Rare used means that the fog is a thing of the past, and it's refreshing to see when you've been playing so many N64 games for as long as most of us. The game also has a perfect difficulty curve. While you can safely make your way through the game collecting just a bare minimum to get to the finish, the sheer amount of collectibles and hidden secrets means that long after completing the game you'll be heading back into the world to find all the Jinjos, music notes and more on offer. But for those who are maybe going to be playing this game for the first time, John, I'm wondering if you've got any words of wisdom that you could pass on to the people watching. Okay, so I hope you're beginning to get the picture. It's all about helping Banjo and Kazooie get from one world to the other, decoding all the clues and characters, finding all the puzzle pieces, and saving Little Sister. Not that I don't think you're up to the challenge, but here's a few quick tips you might find useful as you explore each world. First, be sure to write down everything Brantilda says, because you will need it to answer questions as you move through the game. Plus, each time you play the game, the answers may be different, so listen up and take notes. Second, find Cheetle the spell book in Gruntilda's lair. Cheetle gives you codes for red and gold feathers and blue eggs. You'll find him first behind the entrance to Bubble Gloop Swamp. Finally, use your gold feathers to defeat the ghostly ghouls in Mad Monster Mansion, instead of just trying to avoid them. These ought to help you out some on your quest to rescue Tootie and meet face to face with the evil witch because there's no pair better suited than Banjo and Kazooie to kick Gruntilda's warty butt. 
and then rounding off the total package is the game's awesome music. Grant Kirkhope yet again delivered big time with Banjo-Kazooie. Each of the game's worlds has its own distinct score and it fits in beautifully with the theme of the level you're in. Adding to this the dynamic soundtrack which changes depending on which part of the level you're in. You can spend ages walking around Gruntilda's lair just listening to the music alone, as it swoops from one style to the next and I bet everyone watching can hum the tune from the top of their heads because they are just that memorable. Throw in some crisp and clear sound effects and also the comedy gobbledygook that each of the game's characters spurts out whenever they are talking makes this quite possibly one of the best sounding games on the console. It may surprise you then to find out that my memories of this game are not all entirely happy though. You see, when I was reading previews of this in my beloved N64 magazine, my brother was actually seriously ill in hospital, and when I'd go to the hospital to visit him, we would talk about how cool this game looked and read over time and time again the articles in the magazines. Then one day on the way to the hospital to visit my brother, my dad asked me if there were any new games to get for my brother to play in his hospital bed. We made a detour and picked up Banjo-Kazooie, and I remember playing it for hours that day with him while he was still in hospital. It sure beat the old NES the hospital had with its selection of crappy games. But hey, they are just my memories. John and I want to hear your memories of Banjo-Kazooie. Like many gamers of the time, did you pick this up on launch day after the incredible reviews and hype the game got? Or have you only just discovered this recently, urged to do so by the legions of rare fans such as myself who swear by this game? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And before you go, John, what are your last thoughts on our Bird Bear team? They may not be the Caped Crusaders, but they're twice the fun, so what are you waiting for? The bat sign? Thanks, John. And as always, thanks to all of you who've watched. And until next time.